Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, session entitled New Frontiers for DHS2. I will uh, share my screen just to give a quick presentation of the two presenters we have here today. So um, we have one hour and, and two presenters. First, we have Justin Fay from USA site. Uh, talking about the integration of climatic data for disease prediction. Um, then after that, we have Elmerie Klausen from his South Africa, talking about their work on, on data science uh, methods. So um, without further ado, I will, will leave the, the floor for Justin to start. And I believe in the chat, you will find the link to the community of practice where you can post any, any questions you have. So, Justin, please. I think uh, maybe while, while uh, Justin, if you could look at uh, a potential um, Is thing that you could data? do, we can give the word to, to El Marie Hello. to present first. And then I think we can, we can uh, try some solutions, Justin. Okay, if, if it's okay, we, I think we can, can uh, swap the the order of presentations and, and give right. the word to Elmarie first. Hi, Johan. Uh, am I coming through clearly? Yes, thank you. Okay, I will start um, sharing my screen then. Just a sec. I was just a tad. Uh, okay, for this, uh, it should come up uh, now. All good. Um, then, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm happy to connect with you virtually today. I'm Elmerie Clausen from HESP South Africa, where I'm the manager for data science. I'm also joined by Jakob Fenter, the manager for product development. This is a combined effort between our teams to develop this application. Is data science in DHIS2 science fiction? Predicting trends or estimating targets used to be a challenging process, but not anymore with the emergence of data science. Coupled with DHIS2, you now have a powerful and informative tool at hand. Data science combines the technical dis disciplines that solve business problems through the extraction of knowledge from data. In other words, our presentation is going to show you how we have made solving complex analytical problems simple and accessible, applying data science techniques. In the past, we have become used to collecting data and preaching turning it into information by illustrating it on graphs and tables, but very few reach the level of transforming that into knowledge, resulting in informed decision making and planning. As we embrace the fourth industrial revolution, we need to take advantage of technology to provide longer and healthier lives for all. Predictive analytics, machine learning, and other data science methodologies coupled with clinical insight and knowledge will lead to a positive impact in client outcomes. This is the problem we are addressing with our solution. So our problem statement was that we needed to use predictive analytics to set targets. DHIS2 does have predictive functionality, but it requires the selection of a specific function, which is applied to all health facilities data. Instead, we want to enhance the predictive functionality on DHIS2 by providing a model that selects the best fit curve, thus enhancing predictive accuracy. This is continually improved through training the model with every iteration using machine learning. The methodology to get the best fit algorithm. Um, so not all data in a specific data set fit into a specific function. For example, it's tricky to select one function to apply in the same manner to all clinics, CHCs and hospitals, or even for all clinics in a given area. It is well known that there are different algorithms for predictions. 
This may be based on the variables that affect it. We developed a process which runs through all of these algorithms and identify which is the best fit for a specific set of data. This output demonstrates the outcome of all of the algorithms and identifies the one that is best fit to predict the trend of the data. Best fit is where the regression coefficient discloses to one. It ran through all six functions and select the one with the best regression. In this example, the parabolic curve number two was the best fit. The next best fit curve was the cubic curve. For reference, the best two outputs are displayed as seen here. Since we store data in DHIS2, we decided to build a DHIS2 app. The interface should be able to select source criteria, for example, the organizational hierarchy, the data element, and the period of source data. It should define the prediction uh, criteria, for example, the period of the prediction, whether to do a forward or backward prediction, whether to store the data or to do a dry run. It should define the output data element for storing the predicted values and display the output results in a user-friendly format. So following here, we show the DHIS2 app that we have designed um, with a toolbar on the left selecting uh, uh, three parameters uh, to work with. And the output uh, you will see on the right. There are three parameters to work with. The first is um, the source criteria. The, you select the data element uh, or, uh, and, and um, define the organizational unit hierarchy and the period for which to run the prediction. As each value is selected, it is stored on the right-hand side um, in the prediction selections. The predictions uh, can be run at different levels uh, in the organizational hierarchy, hierarchy but by selecting the level at which it, which it should be run, and then to select the period for the source data. Selecting or adding source data element, uh, name, and the number of periods for the prediction. Of course, the greater the amount of historic data used in that input, the more accurate the prediction. And to select whether to do a dry run or not, and a dry run uh, will not store the data. The prediction we're running here is to support the 95-95-95 targets, which states that 95% of people living with HIV should know their status. 95% of people who are known positive should be on treatment, and 95% of people on ART treatment should be virally suppressed. We therefore monitor the number of people remaining on ART as a national indicator, which this prediction was run on for a district, and we are going to show the, you the outcome from a number of facility predictions. South Africa aims to increase the number of people on ART by 2 million in two years. Therefore, most facilities should increase uptake on ART through appropriate interventions. To verify our model, we developed an option to compare the predicted data with real performance. In these, the output for the prediction is used, reduced by the number of predicted periods. The input period we ran here is from um, March 2014 until uh, August uh, 2019. Then we predicted data forward for 12 months and compare that with real data for the same 12 month period. On these graphs, the blue line represents the actual data and the red line represented predicted values. From 2017, in this particular graph, it is clear that um, the, the trend slowly decreased with another increase and a subsequent decrease again. The prediction follows the same decreased trend, though the real data shows a gradual increase with a sudden drop. The parabola or cube fit will smooth out the humps in data and provide a reliable prediction. When considering the knowledge and insights one can gain from this data, you can now establish why this occurred through consultation with the health facility 
and implement appropriate interventions. Here are some more results uh, from the prediction run, which is similar. And even with extreme variances in the earlier data, as can be seen in this uh, uh, graph, the adaptive methodology selected a method resulting in a close match to the actual values as seen here. The predictive values in this are higher than the reality, as you can see. Um, but it is clear from the graph that the prediction uh, looks accurate. This allows investigation into the reasons for the actual performance deviating from expected performance. We developed a 1990 report to assist health facilities to monitor their performance towards facility targets, which was set using methods before this prediction method was uh, developed. South Africa is still using 90% targets for health facilities since most are not yet reaching the 90% uh, for them to push them towards 95%. Since we see such a wide discrepancy in this prediction, we wanted to look at the 1990 HTML report in DHIS2 for further insight. As you can see from this slide, a manager commented on this report, providing interpretation of the information. She reflects that the HIV tests done are only 61.4% of the targets, which has a knock-on effect on the indicators. If more people are tested, more positive clients will be identified and more started on ART, resulting in those remaining on ART being closer to the target. The viral load done at six months is below the target, which means the result of the viral load suppressed values also being below the target. This analysis would assist the facility manager or health managers to identify reasons for the lower than expected performance, which result in the lower than predicted number of patients remaining on ART, as seen in the prediction graph. This process will provide insight when coupled with clinical knowledge and expertise on the external factors that influence the data. Studying based and work with practices and implementing corrective measures based on those, the health system can now gain wisdom on how to intervene appropriately in order to make an impact through improving health outcomes for the client, bettering the lives of all. You can also see in the graph uh, on the right how this facility's poor performance is um, impacting the district to not meet their targets. Um, the green uh, bars are um, actual performance and the blue are the gap uh, from the 1990-90 targets. What you have seen today is just the beginning and we don't plan to stop here. Our upcoming include adding functionality for indicators and program indicators, um, to refining accuracy through machine learning, releasing um, this as a DHIS2 app to the community to share with all of you, applying the insight gained to achieve impact for clients, and enhancing the AI capabilities through neural network integration. At TESP, we believe in creating better lives for all citizens. We do this through our products and services, our partnerships and our business pursuits that adapt with the changes in the environment. We pride ourselves on being a learning organization that continually innovates and collaborates, making use of novel technologies and creatively solving problems with the collective mindsets in our organization. To find out more about what we do and how you can get involved, connect with our managers and read more about us on our website. Thank you. Um, on. Thank you very much, uh, Elmarie. Um, so, uh, Justin, can we try again with your presentation? Do we have Justin here? I think she might have left again. She was trying to test her um, 
internet connection at this stage, which is what I think was causing her um, audio problems. Okay, so while we're waiting for her to to um, reconnect, uh, uh, let's see if there are any questions. There are no written questions yet. To see if we get um, just in on now. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to remind you that you can post your questions on the Community of Practice page. I see we have Justin uh, about to join or trying to join. Give her a second to see if we can get the connection here. Seems to still be some some uh, troubles joining. There we have Justin. Um, if you Grant can give Justin the co-host authority. There we go. Justin, if you want to try and talk again for us. Can you hear us, Justin? If so, please uh, unmute and try to talk again. Okay, I think uh, while we try to connect with Justin, we can have we have a question uh, written here for you, El Marie, on the community page um, by Anna Tusheng. And I can read it out for for you all. Um, to what extent are the predictors you present in use in South Africa, and who runs these predictions? Uh, does this happen at district facility level, or uh, do they need technical assistance to do that? Hi, and um, thanks for your question. Um, we, um, we, we have recently completed these predictions, um, so we are still uh, presenting this to the ministry in terms of uh, the use. Um, but essentially, I think it's not really required um, for health facilities to run it. Um, it. It would be more run at a higher level, um, at uh, periods where they developed um, plans, uh, performance plans, uh, annual plans to, to set realistic targets. And we also want to work with them on um, increasing uh, the use of these uh, predictions to uh, not just use it as um, uh, predictive functionality, but as, as pres pres prescriptive analytics. In other words, if they, or, uh, through machine le learning, you can actually identify uh, what uh, um, activities or what best practices would um, result in, in higher performance than other practices. We would then feed that into our machine learning models and be able to assist the department to aim for higher targets and then prescribe to users uh, or to health facilities what activities it is that would help them to achieve those um, higher targets. Um, so the use for this is, uh, is very broad in terms of where we can uh, use it. Um, also in identifying where uh, problem facilities are, and um, assist those facilities to address um, those issues. Um, so um, it's still a new uh, uh, developed, um, but uh, we foresee it being more run at higher levels. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have lost uh, Justin again. So, so we continue with more questions and please uh, feel free to write them down on the community of practice. I, I have a question, uh, Marie. This, um, uh, you, you alluded to the, it in the last slide that you will make this app available. Can you say something about uh, the timeline here and you know how, how much uh, flexibility do you foresee in this in terms of adjusting it to different cases and different uh, predictive analysis? Sorry, how much? Uh, what what will be the 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 aim in terms of flexibility of use cases, etc.? Will it be a very um, uh, very custom made app for very specific predictive analysis, or do you plan to to have it more open for uh, a greater variations of use? Um, I think it is open for a greater variation of use. That's why we want to include um, program indicators and um, indicator values as well. And as long as the uh, source data that will be used is of a fair period, um, uh, we foresee that to have quite a, a wide um, variety, uh, wide use. Um, and we, therefore, we, we do foresee it to be something that um, can be used by the wider community. Thank you. Uh, I see we now have Justin um, online with us. Can you try to unmute and, and uh, talk a bit, Justin, to check the sound now? Can you write in the chat if you are able to hear us? In the meantime, I think we have one, one more question for you, Anne-Marie. Um, and it's about, uh, you know, the original request for this app. Uh, is this something the demand this, this work is going out from? Is it um, coming from, from specific health programs or more broadly? Or is it something you have engaged with uh, HISP South Africa more on, on your own? Um, yes, thanks. Uh, we, the request initially came from the ministry, specifically the unit um, uh, dealing with uh, uh, planning uh, to be able to assist them to set uh, realistic targets. Um, so we have um, produced this for, for that reason. Um, but also that it, it has um, many other, it, it, it will assist many of our other clients as well. So um, we, uh, yeah, the, the initial request came from the ministry. Yeah. Okay. Um. One last uh, try again, uh, Justin. Okay, I th think she, she will be joining by phone uh, quite soon. So in the meantime, if there are any more questions for Emory. Looks like we've got one, a hand up from Scott. Hey, thanks guys. I just actually wanted to say, Elmery, what an incredible app and I really can't wait until it is uh, shared with the community. I think it'll really benefit a lot of folks. Um, second time I've been able to enjoy seeing the presentation, I learned something new this time as well. Um, one thing I was gonna say, in, in your presentation, you mentioned that DHIS2 does have some kind of core out of the box predictive abilities. I think that you're being really nice when you say that actually. Um, to be honest, we, DHIS2 is able to have calculations that can forecast uh, data based upon some simple like averages or standard deviations, really basic um, formulas, really calculations to be able to generate data that would be um, projected forward in time. But nothing anywhere close to as advanced or uh, as you've been able to do with your predictive an analytics and certainly nothing with machine learning. And I think this is really kind of a, a pretty incredible uh, first leap into machine learning in, in DHIS2. So as, as more use cases come online, I, I would love to 
stay close to them and, and hear about them and, and learn from them. That's all I had to say. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks, Scott. Uh, you know, we we investigated the functionality that is there, but specifically for this specific use case that I was presenting, we found that different uh, facility types, some had a declining trend because of um, referrals, others were uh, in, increasing, so it just wasn't easy for us to use, uh, to select, a, pre-select a specific uh, uh, say exponential cur curve or however we you know a, a deviation um, so um, it, uh, it it's been uh, coming up from need um, uh, and uh, it does require um, quite a, a long uh, um, uh, amount of data so because we had that it, it was easy to to develop a um, system we have data for um from 20 from 2000 really which helps uh, help us a lot in developing the these algorithms way. and um so but thanks uh we will definitely right. like to work with the community on finding more use cases and right. refining um, this algorithm thanks uh, thank you do we have you here now, uh, Justin? Yes, yes, I'm on. Very good, excellent. Floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And sorry about the previous instance of the voice not coming through. Um, Justin Fay Katweske. Um, specialist for USID, Strategic Information Technical and your conference about my research findings that uh, I did at my master's degree at the School of Public Health, Macquarie University. I'll be presenting to you the results we got from integration of DHIS2 and climatic data. Purposely, I did that for disease prediction. And I took a case study of malaria occurrence in Gulu District, Uganda. This research was done in collaboration with other people like Dr. Peter Navende, Dr. Simon Kasasa, Ronald Senyonga, Mary Nakafero, and John Tisa. Their addresses are listed on that cover page. Next slide please next next slide go cool, sorry okay. keep going what was say, the problem area and what motivated me to do this research I realized that many researchers have discovered that prediction models, that prediction models are important and they can actually assist public health in evidence-based decision-making. However, when I looked into what has been done in Uganda, I realized that we were only depending on disease burden estimates. We were only looking at our burden estimates based on the... We were only looking at disease burden estimates based on our DHIS2 reported data and the, and the rough estimate of our seasonal, we didn't have any kind of way of Justine, we're losing you again. Oh, yep, yeah, I think we've lost her again. Oh, 
Okay, I think uh, while waiting. Yeah. Justin, I th think there is something going on with your internet connection there. We can barely hear you again. Yes, can you now hear me? Okay. Yes. So, I, because in Uganda we were only relying, even up to now, we only relied with the changes. And I, you, still, you still can't hear me. No, I'm up country. We can hear you now, yes. Please continue. You can you can hear me now. Yes. Yeah, that's better. All right. You know, um, sorry, I'm actually up country, and our up country network sometimes doesn't work so well. But I had reached a point when I was saying that I reached a point when I thought that we could still be having malaria as an endemic in most of our regions because maybe we, we don't target our interventions at the right times of the dependent on weather changes. So I set out to see if there is any relationship between malaria occurrence and climatic or weather changes. I went out and got data from the Ministry of Health and the Uganda National Meteorological Authority locally collected data that is collected weekly, monthly, quarterly, or yearly. But I rely on malaria cases and weekly data of our weather changes. So we, because other people had integrated their data, so their data and found some relationships. I went out and also started integrating our data to see if we can actually see a relationship between malaria cases and of our country. But this time I was only looking at Golo districts. So we 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 decided to explore what approaches are currently being used by the National Malaria Control Pro Program to predict malaria occurrence and what control measures and prevention measures have been happening since the year 2013. Then we also wanted to establish the suitable combinations of the variables and their time lags for malaria cases or occurrence. And we also set out to provide some machine learning models and some predictive models. And this research study used the methodology that we, we call the mixed methods design, where we included qualitative and we did a retrospective cross-sectional data collection and analysis of our local. So uh, Justine, I think we've lost you again. Okay, yeah. I think we have lost Justin again. Yeah, um, this is is not uh, going too easy. So, I, I think uh, I mean let's take the opportunity. Um, waiting a couple of minutes. Um, let's take the opportunity to ask Marie any more questions or raise any issues related to to this work and the topic of this session. You can probably uh, use the um, you have the ability to raise your hand so you'll be able to talk. Yeah. 
Yes. Hello. Can I continue? Can you hear me? You're back now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> okay, I'm on the slide of qualitative findings, the research findings that we got from our research. Or should I go back to research objectives? Okay, there. All right, so what, what we found was that our National Malaria Control Program currently relies on seasonality malaria outcomes and to determine what control measures so they can be like the rain season is about to start, then let us start distributing mosquito nets. Then they start distributing mosquito nets. And then other times they will be like, I think there is some, it's a lot of stagnant water around some villages. Let us start doing indoor residue spraying, IRS. But actually, sometimes, as we shall see from the quantitative findings, we discovered that malaria cases do not happen. They do not increase before the rains. They actually increase after some time when the rain has occurred. So for them, they just say in September, we are going to distribute mosquito nets. In January, we are going to do IRS. But actually, they are not backed by evidence of when actually is the right time to distribute the mosquito nets. Then we also found that Guru District in particular uses different interventions. And they have ad adopted the combination preventive mechanism. However, we did not find any documentation of when the different of when the different interventions happened. They did not have an actual date of maybe we distributed mosquito nets from this period to this period. So I couldn't determine whether the increase or the reduction in malaria cases as seen in DHIS2 was due to the distribution or to the distribution of malaria cases, whether it was due to the IPT that happened because there was no documentation at district level to show that from this time to this time we were doing IPT. Then we realized that they, for them, they distribute massively mosquito nets in September and October of every year not necessarily that they are guided by some weather changes, but it's just their routine program that every September and every October, they distribute mosquito nets. Next slide, please. Um, so what were our key findings from the quantitative research? We realized that during that reporting time, I used data from 2013, to 2017 because before 2013 our DHIS2 did not have weekly data and the, the research started around 2018 so there wasn't much data in 2018 and during our reporting period we realized that an average of 2,689 cases we are seen every week in Gulu district then we also realize for cases they would see a minimum of 468 and they had a maximum of 11,459 malaria cases for that reporting period. The rainfall was on average 28.15 millimeters per week and then with a minimum of zero and a maximum of 163. We also had a minimum temperature in that region for the reporting period of 19.6 degrees centigrade and a maximum of 15, sorry, an average of 19.36, a minimum of 15.27 and a maximum of 22.62. That is the minimum temperature. And the maximum temperature on average was 30.68 degrees centigrade with a minimum of 26.72 and 36.70. Uh, 
And then we had relative humidity at six hours. The average was 75.4, with our minimum being 34.57, and a maximum of 123.07. And we had the relative humidity at 12 hours of an average of 51.19, a minimum of 17.43, and a maximum of 151.29. So we set out to look at these different variables, which one can actually cause a change in malaria cases, depending on how the cases were increasing. We continued merging and integrating, there was an iter iterative process of trying out, let us mix the cases with minimum temperature, let us mix the cases with maximum temperature, how about if we do it with rainfall and then we put some minimum temperature, then rainfall and maximum temperature, rainfall and relative humidity, so we were able to finally come up with a model that we can actually say that if you used this model, you can actually accurately predict the likely cases that might happen in the next month or next quarter or next year. And uh, when we took our data into Weka software to test for predictions, our, as you see in that image, please, next slide, please. Next slide of worker test predictions for targets. Sorry about that. That one. Thank you so much. Yeah, when we did worker test predictions for our targets, as you can see in that image, at the start, when you when as the um, the machine is just when at, when we're just starting to learn, it hasn't learned so much about the relationship in the data so when you look at the actual cases which is red color those are our actual cases from dhis to so that's how they the pattern is they sometimes go up other times they go down so we started to we told worker to help predict the future of these cases and when you look closely at the beginning you can see that there is great variance between the red line and the blue line, meaning Weka hadn't yet mastered the pattern of uh, the cases. But as we travel into the, the way these cases and the climate have uh, are fluctuating on this graph, you see that the blue is almost close to the red dot, now it can accurately predict for us the actual numbers that will happen. And when we actually did the calculations between the differences, we realized that actually worker can predict very accurately, meaning if you got data of like 10 years ago, okay, then 20 years ago, then you tell it to predict the likely cases for 2021 20, as possible, better it lands. Then we, next slide, please. So what was the conclusion from this research? The conclusion was that if we are to have a change in malaria cases that we say are due to weather, the rainfall must have occurred in the maximum temperatures. This can be explained by the fact that when it is raining, the temperatures get so low, it becomes very cold for the mosquitoes to breed. So it is normally after two weeks of rainfall when the temperatures have gone high, that's when the mosquitoes start to breed and then they will start going in and biting people and spreading the malaria from one person to another. Then we also think there should be proper documentation for clear dates of the different intervention strategies. If you set out and go on a national rollout of mosquito nets, we should know that in District A, we distributed mosquito nets from 19th January to 30th March, so that when we 
see a reduction of malaria cases in May or April, we can actually attribute the reduction to the, in, to the malaria, to the mosquito nets distribution. Because currently the way we just distribute without documentation, the, documenting the actual dates, we cannot attribute the changes in malaria cases to our interventions that we carry out in the different regions of the country. Then another outlook is that we can include many other contributory parameters in future studies that could actually improve the prediction accuracy of the models. Because in this research, I only considered climatic data. You could add in the vegetation cover, you could add in many other things to improve the accuracy of the prediction model. And then we also only, look, we only looked at Gulu district because uh, with master's research, I was limited by how many districts I could look at. Otherwise, the worker software could have been able to to analyze the, dat the national data, but uh, limitations of masters, they were like, you can't do a, a national data analysis. So I think if we could utilize the whole national data and given the fact that artificial neural networks are very data hungry, I believe we, if we used a much bigger data set, we could actually greatly improve the prediction accuracy. Because the one district that I fed in two workers is just like uh, you see a small drop in an ocean and that could explain why it wasn't so accurate to the point from even the beginning of the testing. Then our Uganda national stores, it's data, data in Excel sheets. Yeah, they don't have a clear national database as is with the Ministry of Health. And I think for someone can take this up to, since we are now in DHIS to and HISP Uganda, I think someone can actually think of creating a national database similar to DHIS to for the Ministry of Health, where they can use to collect and enter their data from their different sentinel sites across the country. Yeah, and those were the key findings and outlooks that can actually further this research. And then next slide, please. The next slide is acknowledgements. I acknowledge I acknowledge the IST Africa 2020 conference. They were able to review this work and it was presented and they did not only publish it on their conference proceedings, but they also gave me a second publication with IEEE. And that's the paper link in case you are interested in reading extra details of what was done of the methodologies and the extra findings, you can find them at that link. I also appreciate the support of the Norwegian government that offered me a scholarship through the high train scholarship and uh, knowledge at Makere University using an information technology. And I appreciate the School of Public Health for having grounded my public health concepts. They also supported my conference attendance at that time, both financially and of course academic skills. And a special thanks to my Ministry of Health, Uganda, and the, the DHIS2 community plus its other partners who make sure that DHIS provide the platforms for us to be able to thank you because without this data that they had collected, made this research. And I also thank the Uganda National Meteorological Authority for having given me access to their weather data that they had collected over the years without any restrictions. Yeah, thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation.
Thank you very much, uh, Justin, and, and uh, thanks for all the efforts to, to get online and present your, your interesting work. We still have a few minutes uh, if there are any questions for Justin and, and her work on um, predictions. You can either write them in the community practice page, or I believe also you could, could uh, raise your hand to, um, to talk in this uh, session room. I'll write it in the chat if you feel like. If not, I, I have a, a question for you, Justin. So, um, this, this uh, work on, on predictive uh, or prediction of malaria cases, that would be for how much uh, time uh, ahead can you do this? You say you need a couple of weeks or? Sorry, sorry about your question. Pardon. For how long time in advance can you predict outbreaks of, of malaria? Oh, oh, yeah, you can predict for as, as long as you need to look into the future. You can, because for us, we normally have our cases weekly, monthly, quarterly, and then annually. So you can maybe say I'm budgeting for the next week, then you, you predict for those cases. Or you could say, I want to know how many cases are likely to happen next month. But the fact that these interventions take some time, the idea would be that you predict for the next three months so that you, you intervene before the cases increase. Well, then you could also say, let me predict for the next financial year. Then we could say in the next financial year, there is according to the predictions it's likely to have very high cases then what do we do we put some interventions before that year starts and then we shall actually not see those high cases that have been predicted mm. yes does that answer your question uh yes thank you i was just wondering if if also um you know for would you need um, you would, you know need quite recent data to be able to make predictions? So with with the, the current rainfall and temperature increase today, you can predict more or less with confidence a couple of weeks into the future, or can you predict with confidence uh, longer than that? I was, just maybe yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Th okay. Thank you so much. You can predict with confidence in the nearest future and much longer. Actually, I did test. You'll, you'll see in my paper. I did test the malaria cases of 2019 when I completed the analysis of, tra of use, using 2018 data. I did test the future of malaria cases and it gave me some numbers. Then I got DHIS to actual figures of 2019 and the prediction was very accurate, meaning it can predict accurately both in the short term and in the longer future. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's very, that answered my question. Um, I think we are actually running out of time. So I'd like to thank both the speakers, Justin and Marie, for very interesting and good presentations. And I'd like to thank everyone for showing up and for your patience uh, with us through some technical difficulties. Um, again, thank you, everyone, and um, have a good day. <laughs>